Again, with the permission of the rabbi and the uh, organizers and yourselves, last week we looked at the we looked at the question of tshuva from a background perspective. We tried to look at some of the mechanisms, if you like, behind the theme of tshuva and how it connects with Rosh Hashanah and the uh, mitzvah of shofar and the depth of understanding of what's called Ratzon, or the point of will, or freedom, or volition in the mind. <coughs> Since we are just before Yom Kippur now, let's, let's try to look this evening at the more practical level, and perhaps a little bit of the mechanisms as well, but let's try to emphasize the practical stages that the mitzvah of Chiva incorporates. So let's at least try to walk out of here knowing in practice how to, how to put this mitzvah into effect. You know that the mitzvah involves very few and very simple steps. Now, essentially, chuva is comprised of three stages, past, present and future. That's vidu in the present, speaking out or confessing what it is that was done, that was negative, regret for the past, and acceptance for the future not to do it again. And the mystery here, of course, is how that simple formula could affect the major changes that it does in the neshama, in the spiritual worlds. And last week we looked at some of the, one or two of the facets of, of those mechanisms. One of the mysteries of tshuva is that it does not only uproot the past, but has the potential to change the past. It could reverse the past or reverse the polarity, if you like, of the, of the spiritual energy. Let's just look at that for a moment and then we'll perhaps spend the bulk of the time looking at the practicality. It's well known that and the classic source for this, the classic discussion of this in the recent past of Elchanan's famous Maimar al in which he discusses the idea of the Chavetz Chaim with regard to a particular question that he asked and his own idea other answers have been proposed as well. But the theme there is the question of erasing the past and also of certain components, at least of the past, that are, that are converted. To put it bluntly, tshuva done correctly, mitzvahs can become skuyos. In some places even says so averis. Averis done in the past can become skuyos, merits, and perhaps even, even mitzvahs, using that word very broadly. How, how does this work and what is the spiritual accounting behind it? Let's take, a, let's take a brief look at that. You know that Tshuva done correctly, Tshuva done, the basic mitzvah of Tshuva, Tshuva Miyira, which means Tshuva done out of fear of punishment, but not out of a deep sense of the understanding of what was, what actually was done. Tshuva Miyira erases the past. Tshuva Miyava converts those things that are negative into, as it were, merits. That means explanation. First of all, how does that happen? And secondly, what is the difference between those two? And what's the spiritual accounting that lies behind this whole theme? Again, without getting into the complexity that Rebbe Khanum discusses over there, because there are two components to mitzvahs and various needs full analysis, what we're going to say now looks only at one particular dimension of the issue, but it's a very useful dimension and, and explains many things. Chuba Miyira means that I regret what I've done, not because I intrinsically regret the thing, but because I have fear I'm afraid I may be punished. The, 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 the mechanism, what that achieves is that it, it eradicates the past and leaves me where I was before I did the thing wrong. If you wish to make a graph, you know, if this is a baseline, here's a person moving along at a certain level, certain level of spirituality, let's say if you could measure such things, and this person at a particular point, they do something wrong, and the various committed. You could graph that, you could depict that graphically as a person falling. They've been damaged, there's a spiritual scar, there's some spiritual damage. The person now moves along at a lower level. Chuba returns the person to where they were before. Because Chuba eliminates, eliminates the, the avera, the sin and its effect. But Chuba Mi'ava leaves a person better than they were before. If you would graph that, you'd see the person moving along at this level. They would maybe do something wrong. Chuba Mi'ava, which is a whole different story, does not return them to where they were before. It makes them, so to speak, a better person than they were before they fell. What is the mechanism there? 
The mechanism is like this, and a fascinating application of this outside the world of tshuva, as well, which is a beautiful demonstration of the arithmetic or the, the scientific nature, or if you like, or whatever the words are, the, 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 the precision of the counterpoint and the, the, um, the balance that is set up in the, the conservation of energy, if you like, in the, <coughs> in the spiritual world. The mechanism is this, <clears throat> that if a person has a certain problem, and that problem manifests itself in another area and they drop, Shiva eliminates that, they go back to where they were before. But Shiva Mi'ava has a whole different understanding. Shiva Mi'ava means like this, that I, I regret having done the thing, not because I'm afraid, which means I don't only gain now the self-control not to do it again, but I, I think we, last week we illustrated it like this, to say that if a, if a, if a child does something for which they are later punished. If they don't do it the next time because they're afraid of being punished, so then what they've achieved is a change in self-control. It's a different child, there's no question. But there's no change in the core. Because, and the proof is very simple. If the child could be assured that they would get away with it without being punished, they would do it again. The proof is, now that's the proof. Do I still wish to do that thing that I did before, only I'm too afraid? Which is itself a significant change. But in the core, that means I don't regret the thing itself. Prophet Chaim even goes so far as to say that that's not, that's not really within the, the what we call Toyha al That person doesn't really regret the past. He only regrets the potential future, the punishment. But a person who does Shuvah Mi'ava regrets the thing itself. That means, in a very deep sense, this is a different person. And the reason this is a different person, as we tried to explain, discuss at length last week, is because a person, a, a real change in the personality is represented by a change in will. When the volition or the will, what I want in life, is different. That's the crucial definition of what I am. If I change what I want, that's... In fact, that's the only place I can make a real change in myself. <coughs> beginning at the, with the core. So the mechanism becomes like this. Imagine someone... Imagine someone moving along at this level. This person has never fallen. Because they've never been presented with a temptation which led them to crash. But this person, although they're holding at this level, above the lower level that is represented by the fall, this person has a problem. This person has a flaw in the character, right, which when stressed by the temptation of an Isaiah or an ordeal will cause them to, they don't know that yet. In fact, that's their real problem. They don't know they have this, there's a hairline crack in their axle. Right? You know, you, you, um, you people who, who live in this area, I've noticed that you, most of you drive these big four-wheel drive monsters <laughs> that you no doubt need to get downtown to your, you know, you... Your, your place of work, presumably, you need, you need those things. Those <coughs> enormous monsters, if you drive one of those things out because you're taking a trip through Death Valley, and as you go out over the curb, your axle breaks. There was a crack in that axle, which the stress broke. Right? You're very glad that it broke then, because when they've welded that thing back together, so then when you're traveling through Death Valley, it will, when your life depends on it, it will see you through. There was an undetected crack, which the stress brought out, right? and it caused a in fact, you know, sometimes it's possible to look at a person's x-ray. I've had the experience of looking at an x-ray and saying to the person, you broke your leg ten years ago. The person says, how do you know that? And the reason you know, as any doctor will tell you, is that a fractured bone calluses up thicker where the fracture was than it was before. And it'll never break there again. You know, a, bro- a bone always breaks at its weakest point, logically. After the fracture, there's a callus in the bone, it thickens there, and it won't break there again, it'll break some other place. And you can tell that a previous fracture occurred because where it knits... It is tougher and thicker than it was before. There was a crack which was undetected. The stress brought it out and it can thereby be fixed. This individual was coasting along, thinking that he had no problem. In fact, had a crack in his axle. And when he hit the difficulty, the curve of an isayon, of an ordeal in life, that thing snapped and he became broke. Chuba means that he knit the thing back together. But by definition, chuba mi'ava means that it's knit to the point we won't break again. The Rambam says the definition of, of a Baal Tshuva Gemurah, says the Rambam in the second parak of Hilfus Tshuva, says the Rambam, the definition of, of Tshuva, ma, Mahi Tshuva Gemurah, says the Rambam, what is, that's how it begins, what is, what is, what's a Baal Tshuva Gemurah, says the Rambam, somebody who, when faced with the same situation again, in which he once fell before, the identical situation, this time wouldn't, the Rambam is very exacting in his language. Not only does he say it, he gives a tangible example and he spells it out to an impossible degree of precision. He says, imagine a man who sinned with a woman. And then he does tshuva. And then he finds himself in exactly the same situation as the same woman, the same place, 
He feels the same way about it that he felt before. The Ramam spells it out, makes it obvious that it could never happen. Because it could never be exactly the same issue as it was before. It could be similar, but not exactly the same. What the Ramam means to say is that the definition of a Baal Shiva is somebody who faces the identical situation that they faced before, and this time they overcome the situation because of the work of Shiva, says the Ram. Not because they're too old, not because they, if a person sinned once before, and a long time later they managed to resist the sin. Right? And it turns out that the real reason they resisted it was, you know, the arthritis was too serious to chase whatever it was that they, they chased before. You know, it's a mature breathlessness overcame them, you know, before they <coughs> could get close to the scene of the crime. That is not, that is not the first class Chivas is wrong. And he quotes a possible this, which is, Schores Borecha Bayoim, you should rem- remember your, cre- your creator when you're young, when you can... So he makes it clear that if a person does chuva, that means the work is done sincerely. And not because of, 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 of weakness or because of circumstance, but intrinsically the thing is uprooted and eradicated. And the only de- definition, the only working definition of that, is to be in exactly the same situation that you were once before, and this time through the work that's been done, not do it again. In his being so exact, the Rambam says two things. First of all, that's the perfect measure. And second of all, it's forbidden ever to be in that situation again. He makes it abundantly clear that a person who goes into such a situation and is victorious has failed. We'll have to discuss that too. Because entering the zone of temptation right, is real crime. But what he means is, we'll have to discuss that too, but what he means is that the measure of tshuva is that when the thing has been eradicated intrinsically, and the definition, the measure of that is that it wouldn't happen again, that's called tshuva gemurah. So look, look at how we would graph that, if you want to put that into a, into a, t- a pictorial representation, we would say that this person at this level does not have the scar or the damage of their merit, but they have the problem. They have the character weakness that will lead them to this problem when the time comes. The definition of tshuva gemurah, which they've done before, means by definition then they wouldn't do the same thing again. That means that the weakness has been eradicated. They're higher than they were before. Here was a person who had never fallen. In that regard, this person is better than a Balchiva. You know the famous debate in the Talmud, the Ramam reads it down, who stands on a higher plane? The Balchiva who has fallen and corrected it? Or a person who's remained pure and never... Obviously a person who's remained pure and never fallen is higher. But there's a particular dimension in which a Balchiva is even higher. And the Ramam rules that, brings that as a halakhic ruling. Why? Because the person who's fallen has, has, is a person who had a, a flaw in their character. The flaw, the fall has been used to bring that out and reveal it. And they use that opportunity now to eradicate the problem. So the process has led them to a situation where they don't have, of course, there's one better than that. Of course, what's better than that is detecting the flaw in your character before you fall and welding it together. But that's ideal. Right? Yes, it's a pity that it had to come about and reveal itself through that crash. But now that it revealed itself through the crash, that revealed the problem, the person now uses that experience of fall in order to weld together and eliminate the problem. They are now, by definition, through having fallen, they become a person who no longer has that problem. The mechanism is now, you have to understand, beautiful thing to understand, the fall has become an intrinsic and inalienable part of their eyes. Kina falti kanti, that's the depth of it. I, I have risen because I fell. What do you mean, kina falti kanti? What does that mean? It means that I wasn't up before. It looked like I was up, but there was a damage, there was an instability, which has now been eradicated. Yeah? Ki shafti Because I sat in darkness, I'm in the light now. Because I fell. Tzadik has to fall seven times before he's genuinely up. So what's happened is the Avmeira, a person who looks back on such an occasion, will relish the moment that he fell. Now, now, retroactively. He wouldn't give it up for anything. Because that was the experience that became part and parcel, as it were, of his growth. Right? And therefore, that's, that's one understanding, a deep understanding of what it means that the Avera has become a schus. How does an Avera become a schus? The Avera has now become an essential part of this elevation. So it's involved, it, there would have been better not to do it. It would have been better to eliminate the problem in character, which is what the Neshama is. The Neshama in the next world isn't mitzvahs and Averas. The Neshama is its own intrinsic material. But that, mater- that material is weak and flawed, or, or, or healthy and, and whole. So this mechanism is what re- revealed the problem, and yeah, so far so good, right? Are we, t- are we together? There's a beautiful application of this, which is fantastic to understand, and that is, what happens when you reverse the picture? What happens when a person does mitzvahs and later regrets them? Now you well know 
that there's one department here, which I don't intend to discuss now, in which regretting mitzvahs in the past is not the same as regretting our barriers. That's the famous question that Rabbi Khanan asked the Chavetz Chaim, and I, I think in this very forum you've studied that, that question before. It's a classic source, so you should then look it up. But in the dimension where they do compare, there's a wonderful application of this. What happens to a person who has done mitzvahs in the past and then regrets them? In certain departments, the person who regrets a mitzvah has not fallen to where they were before they did the mitzvah. They're worse than they were before they ever did the mitzvah. And paradoxically and strangely, the judgment that comes out of this is that that person should not have done those mitzvahs. They weren't ready. No, let's, get it, let's get it clear. Here's a person who's moving along at a certain level. Never done a mitzvah. Particular mitzvah. Opportunity comes their way to do the mitzvah, stresses them in the soil, they rise to the occasion. The person's a better person than they were before. There's the, there's the accrual here of spiritual benefit. This person's been uplifted. They now move along at a higher level than they were before. What happens sometime later when they have occasion to regret what they did? So regret, parallel to Chuba Miura, would drop them to where they were before. But genuine regret, definition, that if they were ever put in that situation again, this time they would not do the mitzvah. Yes? Counter poise too. Then they wouldn't be where they were before. They'd be worse. Huh? Example. Here's a person who is sitting in their home, a certain amount of money, right? which they are not going to give away. person arrives with an emergency need. Person, this person rises to the occasion to give their money. Tremendous benefit. They overcame their own selfishness. They gave away. What happens when a few minutes later someone re- runs in and says, I have the most amazing investment for you. If you have X, Y, Z amount of money, you'll be rich forever. And the person starts saying, I wish I'd never done that mitzvah. If it ever comes my way, I'll never do it again. So if they regret it sincerely, to the point, according to Ramon's definition, that if they had the chance to do it again, they would not do it, they're a worse person than they were before. Why? Because here, this person, although they've never done the mitzvah, they had the capacity. They had that degree of inspiration. Were they faced with such an opportunity, they would do it. But the process has led them to a situation where having risen to that occasion and not regretted it, they, they would not do that thing again. This was a fatal error, this mitzvah. Just then, what, what would the application be? particularly in the field of Emunah. Give an example. Example. What should be the assessment? Here's a practical, tangible example in an area that's very hard to calculate otherwise. What is with the person who's deciding to take a step in Emunah? Step in Emunah. Here's a person, for example, who runs a business, eight hours a day. They're challenged to work less and learn more. Suppose they're Rosh Hashanah, my earnings are fixed for the year. If I work six hours a day, or four hours a day, I'm not going to earn any less. After all, Ishtadlis is only a tax. No one tries to maximize their taxes. You try to minimize. So, let me work less and learn more. How much, how much should a person stick their neck out anymore? Is that the right thing to do? How much Ishtadlis is necessary? The age-old question of Ishtadlis and Bitochen. How do you assess that? How do you work out? You can't ask a Shiloh about that. That right? avenue is closed. If you ever go and ask a Shiloh about Emunah, you'll be told the maximum Ishtadlis and the minimum Emunah. Because Emunah you can't ask. You have to beat. If you go ask your Rebbe if you close your business half day, any sensible Rebbe is going to tell you no. Because if you have to ask already, you're not ready. Emunah is the thing that you have to know Hashem is going to take care of you. You have to know. You have to feel it and know it and have no doubt. As soon as you have to ask somebody else, you, 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 you're out of the passion. And therefore, this, where can you turn? So you have to look within yourself. How do you assess whether you're ready to do such a thing? There's a wonderful calculation. Ask yourself, what will happen? What will happen? Let's say I decide, I close my business eight hours a day and I'll work four hours a day. And I'll sit and learn. What would happen if at the end of the month or the end of the year, I earn half what I earned before and I don't have enough to live on? What will I say? If I will say to myself, it's got nothing to do with the as Hashem provides, it's testing, He's testing me, and I go right on doing it with total limona, obviously that was the right amount of reduction of Ishtadlis that the person should have done. But if this person's response will be, I was a fool to work less. You don't work, you don't earn. There's no one there taking care of me, etc., etc. That person stuck their neck out of me money to a dangerous level. They shouldn't have done that. Their calculation is beautiful. When you decide how much to reduce the effort you make, how many locks you'll put on your door, right? how much Ishtadlis you'll make to earn a living, how much effort you'll make to find the right marriage partner. Whatever it is, each of these has different... Torah measures also needs to be discussed more sensitively. But in general, the answer is, make that amount of effort that if it goes wrong, you won't regret it. More than that is dangerous. 
I heard a wonderful, I once heard a wonderful example of this. I, I had to talking to the Rosh Kolel in a famous yeshiva in the Negev. It was a very well-known Rosh Hashiva. And he told me an amazing incident that occurred. It shows you how the Torah mind works, often contrary to what you might think. There was a situation once in that yeshiva a number of years, or many years ago, where there were some young Sephardi boys from a certain development town in the area, from very depressed socio-economic background. Pe- you know, pe- people, uh, young men with very few opportunities. And they were learning in the yeshiva. A group of them came to the Rosh Yeshiva, this is what the Rosh Kolo told me. They came to the Rosh Yeshiva when they were 18 years old, and they said to him, we have now an ordeal. Most fellows our age are now going out to get jobs, apprenticeships to learn trades, etc. We want your advice. If you tell us to stay and learn another four years, we'll learn four more years in Yeshiva, and we'll do it. You're talking about Tmimus, boys with a certain naive purity, even in a very positive sense. We'll, we'll stay and learn. If you tell us to go and get jobs, yeah, you're our rabbi, whatever you tell us, we'll do. He said to them, leave now. Leave now, go and get jobs, learn a trade, yeah, that's what you'll do. Now, can't you imagine, here, here young boys come, boys who are in learning, they're going to go out to the difficult world of... of and I ask you sincerely, you could learn. So the Rosh Kodal, when he after the incident, he said to the Rosh Yeshiva, why did you tell him that? He, you turn boys away from Yeshiva? For, he said, look, what will happen if these young men stay and learn for four more years? And they learn sincerely and they grow and they develop. Four years later, they go out to look for jobs. And they find that it's difficult. They're competing in a world where the other fellows started young and they can't get jobs. They may regret the learning that they did. And if they do, they wipe it out. So what did they gain? I should keep them here for four more years doing something which I mean, induced them into a situation that they're going to regret. And they might end up worse. Now's the time to leave. It's a remarkable thing. This is the counterbalanced situation of this calculation. It's a very, ta- very useful, tangible. Ra- Ra- Miller, that Sal from Gates, had used to, this is what he used to teach his Talmudim, boys and girls, that this is the one tangible measure, if you like, rule of thumb, that you can use to assess how much you start to make. It's a very, a very useful, very useful test. Let's look now, let's look now with your permission at the mitzvah itself. Let's look at the details of Chuvah and see if we can work through them and try to point out exactly the, 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 the technicalities that we need for the next few days. First of all, if we want to, let's divide this mitzvah into as broad a spectrum as possible, right? As broad brush strokes as possible. We do it like this. There's one category that we'll put up on that side of our blackboard which the Ramam discusses in the seventh parak of Hilfus Chuba, which we're not going to discuss this evening, and that is the kind of Chuba a person should do before death. That is not the specific Chuba for a particular action or a particular area of my own inner problems. That is the Chuba, the Vidui, and Chuba that a person should do before dying. And the Gemara talks about it, the Mishnah talks about it. The obvious question is, how do you know when you're going to die? So you do it, the Mishnah says you do this every day. You do this every day. This is a special form of Chuba, it has an overlap with the mitzvah that we'll discuss. And it is not a regret for particular actions that have been undertaken or done wrongly. This is a chuva for the misuse of a life opportunity. In other words, this is not because I did this act that needs to be eradicated from the world. This is because I was given a life opportunity, a mind, a body, circumstances, tools. And not only did I not maximize their use, but I failed... Yeah, I, I, I did damage as well. Failed to use them to the full extent and use them in disloyalty to the, to the cause. That requires a special kind of tumor, which is not the particular tumor for particular details. The particular, and it has its own... If you wonder why the Rambam discusses tumor in detail in the seventh chapter, he starts discussing it all over again. You look carefully, you'll see this is the particular subject. Let's leave that aside for now. And let's look at the rest of the spectrum of the mitzvah of tumor. To make it absolutely clear, there are five possible divisions to the mitzvah. Three basics, right? Three basic elements to the mitzvah that always must be done. And in certain certain circumstances, two precursor or prior steps that need to be done before you can do the three. The three steps that are always required, always required, are past, present and future, as we said, viduit varim, like the Ramam says, confession in words, regret and shame for the past, and taking on never to do it again. The other two are required only when the victim, when the, when, when the crime has a victim, other than one's relationship with Hashem. In other words, what we call Ben Adam Lachaveroi, when there's a interpersonal damage. Not, and incidentally, this does not mean a crime that takes two. 
Now, that's a, that's a mistake. Male-female issues in the sensual area, for example, are not interpersonal averis. That's between Adam and Makkah. The fact that there's an accomplice or a victim is not the issue. There may be a victim too. Someone may have been taken advantage of. Someone's feelings may have been hurt. That's another problem. There may be many problems. But the actual particular transgression there, in fact, the Rambam lists that very one in this context. But again, in general, if you're talking not about Ben Adam Lamakri, right, eating on kosher food, not keeping Shabbos, things that are done in private. If you're talking about interpersonal things, like the Rambam says, harming someone physically, financially, cursing them, yes, yeah, speaking against them, one of the various where there is not only Hashem to be dealt with, the accounting has to be given, but also there's a, there's a person involved. Before you can do the tshuva that's required, you need first to make up the damage, and second to appease the individual. Right? Those two are often much more difficult, much more difficult than the three. Uh, to put it bluntly, until further notice, if you insist on sinning, limit yourself to those areas that are between you and Hashem. That, uh, you know, leave other people out of it, because if you harm someone else, to make up the damage and to gain forgiveness and appease a person can be extremely messy. Extremely difficult. In fact, until further notice, try and avoid the area altogether. But, <laughs> but that's particularly problematic. Incidentally, while we're on the subject, as a brief aside, strictly speaking, every mitzvah that's between you and Hashem is also between you and everyone else. El Khanan points that out. And also, every mitzvah between me and you, obviously, is also an avar against Hashem. Every mitzvah that I do against you offends not only you, every avar, but also goes against the divine command. So there are two... Yeah. But also, every avar that I do in private, I damage you. Because when I do something in private, that's negative, I bring down the, I bring down, uh, the entire Knesset Israel, right? That spiritual entity, which is the bonded unity of all our Just like one part of the body being damaged, the whole body is to some extent, suffers. Therefore, when I do something in private, you have a claim against me. And when I bring down my level, so I bring us all down. You go down because the people have sinned. Why should Moshe Rabbeinu go down? Because they sinned. Because he's the head of a body. When you step down a step with your feet, your head goes down too. That's incidentally one reason why some of us suffer when others do. One of the reasons why, why when a destroyer is released, he doesn't discern between deserving and undeserving. One reason. And that reason is that we're an organic entity. We one being, really. Right? We don't see that always, unfortunately. That's a big problem. But that's, that's who we are. The result says, the last thought you should have before beginning of the Shemona Esra is Abbas Yisrael. Counter, exact, what's the last thought I should have before I start speaking to Hashem? I think about Hashem. Says, no. The last thought you should have before you enter Shemona Esra, think about Abbas Yisrael. Because that's, where, that's who you are. That's where, your, that's where your spiritual entity is. He's bonded in, locked into that... That, that super rational, that super, that, that, that body which transcends the individual. So when I do something against Hashem, I'm also doing something against you. Nevertheless, there's a use in dividing these two categories. And furthermore, it's important to know, and people often, this is often misunderstood, there's a, there's a particular, again, the division of mitzvahs, or averis, into Ben Aram Lachaverim and Alma Makarim, people think is a, an, is a sort of a, a, a technical division. Something's happened to have a human victim and some things don't. There's a difference in nature to these mitzvahs. It's important to understand. The difference in nature is this. That when I harm someone else, or when I do a mitzvah that benefits you, either way, there, there's a human, there's someone involved, the focus of the mitzvah is the person. It's wrong to focus on Hashem in an interpersonal mitzvah. You should only be doing that after there's full accounting for the person. That there's something peculiar in, in, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you deal with a human being, and you're thinking not of them, but of Hashem. People think it's very frum to do that. It's a mistake. It's a mistake. Right? Can we demonstrate it? Of course. Let's say, I'll give you a very clear demonstration. Let's say you go into an interpersonal mitzvah, Biko Khalim, for example, someone's sick. So now, who are you, who's the recipient of the, where's this mitzvah targeted? Where's it posited? So if it's Hashem, you function one way. If it's the person you're going to visit as it should be, you function entirely differently. For example, this person is very firm about the mitzvah, right? All they're thinking about is serving Hashem. So they want to do this mitzvah right. So what are they hoping? That the person is going to be as sick as possible. Of course, sick as possible. Because on the contrary, they're more, more juicy as right? More mohuda. If they're really suffering and if it's really gruesome, you know, that's a juicy mitzvah, right? And if they'll arrive at the bedside and the person will have gotten better, they'll be thoroughly disappointed because... <laughs> 
I once went to visit someone in hospital with a person. I, a person is obviously a person that is at the spiritual level. And the two of us were going up and we, we walked out onto the floor with the, the ward. And I made a big effort to go and visit this person. I really did. It took me a long time and I gave up a whole afternoon and I slept and I... And when we got into the thing, the nurse told us the patient had been destroyed, d- uh, discharged. And I said, I said to him, I f- found myself saying, what a chutzpah said, what a chutzpah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and I was ashamed of myself because I saw this other person had a genuine rejoicing. A genuine rejoicing. Based on that. In fact, his response was, I get the scar for coming anyway. It's quite true. Of course, he gets the scar anyway. So if you really are selfish, if you really want to do it, you should hope that the person's gotten better. And you get the reward anyway. But we don't function that way. I want to serve Hashem. I want to shake this person like a muhud, like an Esau gets shared. That's obviously... That, that, the, the, the reason there's a difference here in these mitzvahs. The kavon and the mitzvah here is what Hashem wants from you here. Is to relate to the person. Of course, in depth, the reason you relate to that person that way is because that's Salaman Hakim. But the thing to grasp here is that the focus of the mitzvah, the focus of where does Hashem here is through the, the, the special nature of this person as a person. That's where it is. To, to, to see them as transparent is it's not, it's not the nature of the mitzvah. It's not the, it's not the, each mitzvah has its own tone, its own flavor. And this group of mitzvahs have this particular flavor that the person is a recipient. I once asked a certain Rosh Hashim, I once said to him, I'll share with you an issue, I'll share with you a problem. This is not your world, no doubt, but... Those of us who spend time working with, familiar with and working with the so-called Baal Shiva world, those people, who, those people who, who, who don't grow up in the religious world, those people who grow up normal, they, um, <laughs> they, um, one of the problems they encounter, one of the problems they encounter is that moving into a more orthodox, more observant lifestyle is that they feel a very painful denial of spontaneity. Because, it's an important thing to understand, is because when a person is not bound by mitzvahs, so why do you do that which is good? Why do you visit someone who's sick, or give up your time, give up yourself? Because there's a tremendous welling up of a spontaneous desire to do that. It's a very uplifting thing. And therefore, this person needs help, and you put yourself out, and you help. It's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an uplift in there. There's a tremendous spontaneous expression of self. But when you do it because it's a mitzvah, there's a danger of feeling, not only a lack of spontaneity, but a lack of awe. After all, if you're sick, and someone comes to visit you because it's a mitzvah, so you know they're coming because they have to, and you know, they know, you know, that they're only there because they have to, and, and you know, I mean, you know that they're going to be looking at their watch, and they know you know, and therefore, I mean, where's the feeling? Where's the feeling? And people who lived a life before where the, where the guiding principle wasn't mitzvahs, it was spontaneous, of course there's a low side to that, of course there's a, the low side is that you have this welling up of a feeling when it suits you, and you'll do it for those that it suits you to do. And perhaps where someone really needs, they won't get attention. Of course, it's true. But nevertheless, and it's quite true, there is a, there is a tremendous depth of emotion and of welling up of self-expression in a spontaneous, in an enemy to voice. What is the solution here? The solution here is that to understand that the purpose of mitzvah is when you do a mitzvah, it's a mitzvah voice. Right? When you go and visit someone who's sick, the Torah ideology here is you should be training yourself to be the person who, who does that spontaneously even though it's a mitzvah. That means even if you wouldn't be commanded now, you would be doing that thing. What's the, yeah, the, 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 di- the dynamic here is the energy to train yourself to become that sort of person. Exactly the opposite of doing it because there's a subtle balance here because doing it because Hashem commands me but feeling the human contact in it that I... That, that's a great... And you perceive readily with people who've trained themselves in a genuine Torah death where it's tangible you'll see that the love that comes across and the spontaneity that comes across and the warmth that comes across is so obvious that it's quite, it's quite clear that if it wouldn't be obliged, it would be done anyway. This, in fact, is the depth, although it's not our subject directly, this, in fact, is the depth between Adam and Tzimah and Mitzvah Oasis. Why the Gemara says an, an Eno Mitzvah Oasis, somebody who's not commanded and does is greater. It's a long discussion. But just a brief insight into it. Someone who's not commanded and does, it's true they have a welling up of spontaneous self-expression. But the maximum they could ever express is only themselves. That means when I, when I do something because I really want to, and I put my entirety into it, so it may be fantastic and wonderful and deep, but it can never be more than me. 
But when I do something because an infinite source commands me, I lock in. I become the cutting edge of something that begins in infinity. When Chazal said, Gadol HaMetzuvah Oyseh, they didn't mean a little bit bigger. They meant infinitely bigger. Because when I'm not Metzuvah and I do, so the Tzivoy comes from here, from my Ratzay. It begins here and it expresses me, at best. But when I do, because the ultimate Ratzay commands it, and I say, Ratzay Ratzay and I lock into that partnership, where it comes from the ultimate source, and I'm the, I'm the legs that it walks on, as it were. You know, the Swasemis says, hey, before in Kippur, it's allowed to just dwell on this just for a moment. The, Sw- the Swasemis says that when you, when you do a mitzvah, you lock into an infinite, amazing idea. You know what a mitzvah is? You know the word mitzvah? Do you mind if we digress just for a moment? I'm not going to get fired, am I? The, um, the word mitzvah, people think, means commandment. It's not the correct Hebrew construction. The word tzivui is a commandment. Mitzvah has a different nuance. It also means a commandment. But its root means to be together. But tzavta chada means in one bond. The Hebrew word tzevet means a crew, where different elements function together in, in unison. A mitzvah means that the one who commands and the one who is commanded have bonded into a, a crew or a unit where they work in unison and become one. That's what it means. The depth of it, says the Swasemis, I mean, if one would really understand this idea, one would never be the same, is that the way a mitzvah works is in a, in a, in a completely ineffable source, completely beyond our understanding, a, a desire is formulated. The Ratzon Hashem, that this thing be done. What is the reason for a Ratzon? We said last week, you can't ask that question. It comes from beyond any understanding. Ultimate source, the Ratzon Hashem. And it comes down, as it were, in the divine system, without going into what that means, and it gets formulated as an instruction. Do thus, a mitzvah. And then it stops, and the thing is not done. And then the human being is required to step in. And the human being hears the command, generates the mechanism that's necessary, and goes and does it. So that on the ground, it happens. And a circuit is closed. In an infinite source, a desire is, originates, and down on the ground, it, it gets done. How does this original desire manifest in an action? Hashem is the original desire, and the human being is the action. How does the human being do this? Because by stepping into the breach, as it were, when I enter that zone where the mitzvah stops, it becomes a commandment, but not yet fulfilled, what do I do? I have to step in and make my rotso in parallel to his. I say ritzon I have to negate my rotson to be someplace else, conquer that ego, step in, and make my desire what his is. This says what Samus is what Salam Kim means. You step in here, make yourself exactly want what he wants, but then, unlike him, he who commands and brings it down to a formulation of a command and stops. You take this as a command, will it because he wills it, align your desire with his, and then carry it out. At that moment, you and Hashem fuse into one organic entity in which you become an essential component of his rotson being done. At that moment, you swell to infinite proportion. Because at that moment, you become part of an infinite... Yet your desire originates now not in you. You've negated that, made it transparent. It originates in infinity. And you are the cutting edge that makes it happen. In that moment, when you negate your own ego and step into this thing that you might not have wished to do originally, you become real. Because Hashem is the definition of reality. So you step into being part of a circuit that's defined, that defines reality. In that moment, by nega- again, by negating your individuality, by negating your own ego, by giving it up, you become real. You not only you become the most, the most self-expressed reality. You become, the paradox is in losing yourself that way, that's exactly where you discover yourself. Says what happens. When you spend half an hour doing an Avera, don't tell me what to do, I want to stand here. What happens? What happens is that that circuit is not closed. The Rotson is formulated, comes down as a mitzvah, and there's an empty gap in reality. You stand in that moment in time feeling amazing. Because now in yourself, you represent in a false way all of reality. Who tells me to do this thing? Me! This doesn't come from some place else. There's no negation of ego. I formulate it in and of myself. The Yetzirah here is a divine one. You have to understand this. The Yetzirah, the negativity here, not the sensual negativity that brings you down. This is the negativity of COVID. This is the negativity, this is the Yetzirah, the divine Yetzirah. Yet what moves me here is the feeling that I'm divine. I formulate my own desires. But in that moment when I formulate my own desire and carry it out, I've moved out of reality. I've disappeared. But not only that, reality hasn't been fulfilled. So that the whole thing crashes. In the next world, when a person's exposed to that, the half an hour that you spent doing a mitzvah, what you, the, 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 the tangible representation of that is an electric sense of reality. 
So half an hour that you spend doing an Avera is sensed in the next world as total non-reality, of just not being there. And you're accountable for that. Not only for the moving aside, but for not having built what should have been built at that moment. That's the mechanism of Mitzvah Voice. These are the two categories. Let's go back to our practicalities and see if we can learn the details. Let's start with mitzvahs Ben Adam Lamanke, where there's no human beings involved making it complicated. There are three elements that are needed. These three elements are all that are required. The Ramam says you do these three, the thing is expiated and annihilated immediately. Strictly speaking, that's only mitzvah's essay, again, without going into too much detail. A positive mitzvah that was not fulfilled. The omission of positive commands is always much more lenient than the commission of negative commands. So the omission of positive command, right, a person didn't put on tefillin or didn't say shema, not putting on tefillin happens to be particularly serious. I think we discussed that last week. In one particular way. And it's very much connected to what we just discussed. This connection at this point of origin with that which is beyond. Think about it, you see the, the death. But a positive mitzvah that's negated, not talking here when we have a Besa Mikdash, which is completely different, there's a completely different level there of kapara and atonement. It's an intense lack that we feel at this time. But a mitzvah that's, yeah, that, that's omitted, and Shuvah's done, says the Ramam, Eino zaz misham. That means in English you'd say, on the spot. That's the English idiom. Forgiven on the spot. Before you could move, as it were. Except for two mitzvahs, essay, namely, failure to have a, to be a, a bris, circumcision, and common Pesach, which we don't have today. Those are two exceptions. But apart from that, forgiven immediately. Second is mitzvahs, loisase, transgression of negative commands, says the Rambam. You need to do tshuva, and it hangs in the balance until you survive through a Yom Kippur. Even if on Yom Kippur you're not doing tshuva, even if you're unconscious. But it's sumo shalyom, the day itself brings home the tshuva, the two melt into one, and the atonement is achieved. Things that are more serious, for example, negative commands that have death sentences, or chorus, those things need tshuva, which hangs in the balance, survive through Yom Kippur, and you need also Yes, sorry. A certain degree of suffering, whatever the degree is, brings home those two other elements, and shiva is effective. And there's one category which is more serious than all of those, which requires all three elements and the transition from this world to the next. That means shiva doesn't really cleanse the neshama, it hangs in the balance, and only when a person dies is it brought down. There's only one avera in the book like that, and that is chilul Hashem. You know, that's a chilul Hashem, desecration of Hashem's name. That requires death to expiate. What is a chilul Hashem? You do something a little sharp, let's say, in business. And they say his name's Goldberg. You identify as Jewish, and you did something that's perceived to be problematic, dishonest, it's Chilul Hashem. And, say, the sources, it goes in proportion to your Jewish profile. The more Jewish your name, your appearance, the more you're observant, the more you represent Judaism, the more culpable you are. That's Chilul Hashem. The Ben Yoda says that there's one hope you have other than dying. Not that you have to die sooner than otherwise, just that that moment affects it, but in a is you can't seek to counterbalance this with a serious dose of Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem. You do something scrupulously honest in business and they say his name's Goldberg. Not that is a tremendous... My sister, my sister went to a supermarket in Johannesburg. And when she came home, she found that they gave her two deodorants and on the slip she saw she'd only been charged for one. So my sister, being a very good girl, I mean, I taught everything that she knows, she, uh, <laughs> she went back the next day and she said to the cashier behind the counter, she said, look, I got home yesterday and you gave me this, I hadn't paid, and I've come back to return the... The Portuguese lady behind the counter behind, called together all the cashiers in the supermarket and the manager and they told my sister that in 25 years of running that store, no one had ever come back to return an item, right? And my sister said to them, she said, look, I had to do it, I'm Jewish. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what you call Kiddush Hashem. In fact, it's worth stealing a deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> the point is that, given that hierarchy of requirements, nevertheless, the tumor is required. What are the three components? So Rambam says like this, and it's worth blazing into one's memory. He phrases it in one sentence, the Rambam, which covers all the requirements. If you consider yourself a black belt, then you will not use this formulation of the Rambams. You look up Shara Chuba, there he has 17 requirements. <laughs> but these are the three essentials. Rambam says like this, you say, Ana Hashem. 
which is addressing Hashem in, a, in an expression of longing. Chatasi <coughs> ovisi I have sinned in front of you with three words denoting what is not really accurately translatable in English, but three levels of unintentional, deliberate, that means even though I knew it was wrong, and thirdly, because it was wrong. Rebellious. Ramam says there's at least some of each of those in every other area. Some of each of those. That is what you are saying, lefonecho, in front of you. Right? Which acknowledges exactly where the offense is placed. That's the preamble. And then you say, vasisi kach vakach. Dotted line, you fill in your own words. Whatever you did. And then you say, that's vidu. What the Raman calls vidu dvori. Confession in words. And then you say, Hare, nichanti uboishti b'maasai. I regret what I've done and I feel shame. Puts both those elements in. Let's regret for the past. And thirdly, you say, Well, oilam eni chayza ledavaz. I'll never do this thing again. Right? Three elements. I think we mentioned them already last week. Three basic requirements. One sentence. That is the mitzvah chile. The easy part, of course, is the words. The hard part we discussed already is the fact that it has to be meant and that a rotson is changed. Let's look halakhically at these three elements. First of all, vidu, confession. So very briefly, try to, to sketch here the, 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 the minimum halakhic requirements are as follows. Vidu must be vidu idvarim, right? The Torah says, this vadu, you shall confess, and the name of the mitzvah in Torah language, in Torah literature, is vidu and vidu idvarim. That means it's a positive mitzvah. It doesn't only expiate and eradicate sins in the past. It itself is a positive mitzvah. Apart from the merits that accrue from converting Averis yeah, into... This itself is a positive mitzvah. This means it has to be done. Some of Hoshim say that if you don't do it now, in Aserah Shem Ha'chim and Yom Kippur, it's an extra Averis, because when the opportunity is specially presented and you, you scorn it, there's a special degree there of culpability, ex- more reprehensible. But this is what it is to be to worry. And the halakas are like this. First of all, it must be spoken, not thought. The mouth must formulate the words loud enough for oneself to hear like tefillah. Thinking these things does not fulfill the mitzvah. Without getting too, into too much detail, thinking tshuva does affect tshuva. But it's not fulfilled the mitzvah of tshuva in vidu itvarim. Hirhure tshuva, thoughts of tshuva, are not nothing. Far from it. Again, it's important to know. A person who thinks tshuva, right, decides to move their life onto a whole new track. That is 100% valid movement of a life. It's machria a person. It moves a person onto a whole new track. It fulfills entirely the purpose of tshuva in the sense of moving a person into a new... First of all, this is essential to know for people who cannot speak. A person is lying semi-conscious with a ventilator tube in their trachea who cannot speak, right? Who has hirure tshuva. This is very far from nothing. This is... And secondly, there are clear proofs. One is a classic proof that the Gemara says that if a person marries a woman on condition that he's a tzaddik. A person marries a woman, right? If I say, I read Mekodeshesli, you are betrothed to me on the, on the condition that I have a million pounds in the bank. And if the lady says, yeah, I mean, one would question her sincerity in the first place, but if she says yes, then if the condition exists, she's married. How about if I say, on condition that I'm a righteous individual, when I'm patently, obviously, a, an evil individual. It says the tshuva is valid. Shema hir her tshuva biliboy. Maybe he decided that moment to cleanse himself and... So he didn't say, he didn't do video, he didn't say confession. You see clearly that the condition is upheld to the extent of validating a marriage if he only thought tshuva in his heart. You see clearly it's valid. What's the difference with vidui? The difference is this. First of all, of course, that's the mitzvah. But the difference in spiritual accounting terms, if you like, is this. I once, I once spoke to a great Kabbalist in Yerushalayim. He put it for me in very graphic terms. He said, a person who's... Mahara and Shubha, a person who decides to become a new person without saying the words of Vidui, is a person who's taken a train that's moving one direction and moved it onto a new track. The train is a new heading to a new destination. There's no question about that. But the baggage still attached. The responsibility for the past remains attached. That miracle, to detach yesterday's accounts, to detach the coaches from the train, that you need to fulfill the positive message of. So there's a hachra, the person moves onto a new track. But you still have schlepping along. Yeah? You want to convert the past, eradicate it, elevate it, transform it, etc. For that, you need to fulfill the positive mitzvah of tshuva. That is a new track plus eradicating the baggage. Yeah? That's the difference. So, vidu dvarim must be spoken out and not thought. Secondly, it must be any language that you understand. Any language. It must be understood. Just like saying shma, the work here is the work of the heart. Right? That is the work. Although the mitzvah is to express it, it must be 
it must be understood. Hebrew is better. I'll be Kabbalah. Kabbalistically, it is better to speak Hebrew. The Kabbalistic sources say that one breaks through certain, uh, certain gates that are opened by Lashon Kodesh, which are not opened by other languages, and therefore Hebrew is better. What do you do if your Hebrew is not good enough? If you're not, you're not, you can't express yourself well enough in, in Hebrew, and you want the benefit, here's something you can do. You can dub in together with a minion and speak any language. If you start together with a minion, and then let's say at the end of the Amida, for example, good place to do it, you then switch into your own personal expression and you use any language, yet a minion opens up certain gates that the individual does not. Equivalent to speaking Hebrew. That's incidentally, can you think of a proof that, that, that a minion opens gates that don't require Hebrew? One word, proof? One word, you only like one word. Kaddish. Kaddish we say only with a minion and not in Hebrew. Right? Kabbalistically, actually, we say Kaddish in Aramaic because Aramaic is the, is the language of the negative, of the dark side, of the negative forces. And so we say Kaddish in their language, we want to knock them out on their own turn. We use their tool to knock them out. And that's a deep Kabbalistic idea. But the point is that we say it only with a minion, and we don't say in Russian. And therefore, you can, and of course this applies to women. If a woman wants to dub with a minion of men, then she can <laughs> get together, and when they dub in, she can, the Gemara has a story about a woman in the time of the Tanoim, in fact, who was exceedingly old, and uh, she came to one of the Tanoim and asked him why she was still alive. She perceived that perhaps it was already beyond the sell-by date, as they say. And um, she, uh, he said to her, what do you do? She said, she goes to a minion every morning. He said, stop for three days. The woman stopped going to the minion for three days and she died immediately thereof. So, you see, no. So, she is doubling together with a minion. When one, a very convenient time to do this, there are two the number of opportunities during the Amida in order to say one's own confession, a very convenient way and easy to get by without halakhic complications of interruptions of the brachas and so forth, is at the very end of the Amida. You know that what we do is, we finish Mona Esrei, which we say in the plural, we then switch into a singular. Did we discuss this in last? We switch into a kind that's all the mera, which is my own singular expression, and then you sign off again with the Yilorotzen at the end, before closing out. You still stand in front of the Shechina, but having spoken now in the singular, and then you sign off. There's a very beautiful custom before you sign off to say your own name. Of course, you don't have the effrontery to say your own name as such, but you say the Pasuk in Torah, which begins with the same letter that your name begins with, and ends with the same letter that your name ends with, as a beautiful Torah hint to where you are located in Torah, right? And therefore, you quote that Pasuk, you quote that verse, that, as it were, introduces you, and then you are moving into your own free expression. The deep reason for this is also fascinating to know. Do you know why we do this? The reason is because when you want to announce yourself, right, the sensitive Jewish way to do this is, imagine you took three steps forward, you're about to address Hashem, and you say your name. You take three steps forward and you say, tax is here. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's not so clear how much attention that, yeah, that, that achieves in Shemaim. We don't do that. We say, Eloke Abraham, Eloke Yitzchak, Eloke Yaakov. That is what you call very big name dropping. That is, you, we start off with a mention of those who are guaranteed to gain attention. That's what we do. I call on you as a great grandchild. That's what we do. And then at the end of the Amidah, you slip yourself in on the coattails of Jewish history by saying your own name. That's our sensitive, that's our sensitive way of doing it. So, what we do here is we, we introduce ourselves and then we say our own, and then you can use any language. So, that is a beautiful way to do it. So let me just revise. Any language must be spoken out uh, audibly. No one else is allowed to hear, with certain exceptions, which I'm not going to go into now, but no one else is allowed to hear, unlike certain other religious systems who confess to an individual. On the contrary, a sign of real shame and contrition is that you don't want anyone else to hear it, and we are not allowed to have anybody else here. And finally, says the Rambam, the more you say, the better. Harez and Meshubah. The more you say, the better. The reason is not because repetition is good, on the contrary. On the contrary. On the contrary. But because there's a sensitive point here, and that is every Avera offends many levels of the Neshama. 
And what you try to do here is speak out all of them. Again, when you do something wrong, you're accountable for the action. You're accountable for the time wasted that you should have been doing a mitzvah. You're accountable for the thought of the aver. All our sources indicate that when you do an aver, you're punished more for the thought than for the action. We're talking here classically in the case where the thought led to an action. If the thought is denied and controlled and suppressed, then there's merit in that, right? With certain exceptions, again, is now not the time to go into. But when a thought leads to an action, then there's more punishment for the thought than for the action. The reason for this spiritually, Nebuchadnezzar Shachayim speaks out very clearly, is because an action offends an animal level of the human construction, namely the body. But a thought of an Avera offends the, the level of divine, yet it means your mind is a, a tool, much closer, much, you know, much more vested with Kedusha. And therefore, thoughts that, that, yeah, that fill the mind, in the classic martial, a person who offends and is, is a, behaves in a coarse fashion in the provinces, is much less guilty than someone who offends in the same way in the palace of the king, in the throne room in front of the king. Yeah, there's much more. And therefore, a person who uses the mind for that which is negative, in that sense, it's worse. So there's a problem with that. There's a problem with the pleasure. There's a problem with the desensitization that Anavera brings about. If other people saw you desensitized, there are so many levels that, that ripple out from one Anavera that a person who is genuinely working on it isn't just saying, I did X, but he speaks out and works through in genuine remorse for all these levels all the dimensions and all the layers of the neshama that have been sullied and soiled. And that's why speaking out more, one of the levels, one of the reasons why speaking out more is better. Those are the three, those are the general areas of Bidu. With your permission, I'm going to take a few minutes and run through the basic requirements and I'll stop for questions if you don't mind. Yes? Uh, so remember your questions. If I didn't cover it, I'll be happy to stop and those who want to stay are welcome to do so. It could very well be that I've left out something important. So that's video. Then you have regret for the past. Here you have to s- express, feel, and express genuine regret and shame. Usually this is not so much of a problem. If one needs motivation, one is allowed to begin with regret because of the fear of punishment. Again, it's a good place to start. And finally, one must say that I will not do this thing again. This is very problematic for many people, so I'll touch on it briefly. It always causes problems. What does one mean? I will never do this thing again. Understand this very clearly. To say I won't do it again means, does not mean a prophetic statement about the future. Because who can say that? Who can, who can say I won't do this thing again in the prophetic sense? Nobody can say that. Right? And many people hold themselves back from this element of the vidu, right? wrongly. What's meant is not, I'm predicting that I won't do it again. What's meant is very clearly, the Ramah makes it plain. As I stand here, if I would now be transported back to that fateful moment, because of the work I've done on myself now, as I hold now, I would overcome that situation. If one can clearly say that, that's what one means. What will be next week when you're feeling low and down and you got depressed and something happened and you got schlepped into a place you shouldn't have been and who knows what, you have to handle next week. The critical issue here is, is this presently sincere? If it's meant sincerely, that means I have conquered and killed this area. It's not part of me anymore. I don't want that thing anymore. Right? I've risen above that. One says this. What happens next week when one does it again, is you have to do tshuva again. Right? You know, again, the reason this we, many people found this difficult, because most of us have problem areas that we keep coming back to. It's like married couples. Married couples argue about the same things that they always argued about. This, for 35 years, they say the same... You'd think they'd have a little creativity and put in a bit of it. <laughs> you know, but that's not the way it is. They go back to the same issues and they use the same words about them again. That's how we are in our own inner marriage. We tend to have problem areas and we go back. What bothers most people is, how can I do tshuva? After all, I've done it so many times and I keep going back to this area. How can I be sincere when I... Yeah, this is a problem. What one means is, if one is sincere that I've negated this area, you do tshuva. If it happens again in the future, then you have a problem. You have to do tshuva again. What is definitely not allowed, says the Rambam, and he lists it as a separate avera, is to say that I've conquered this area when you haven't. To say that I won't do it again when you're really thinking of the next time, says the Rambam, is completely invalid. Shubha, it's a new avera, you're lying through your teeth. And for that you have to do Shubha again. In such a situation, one should say, this is what I did, I'm ashamed and sorry, help me not to do it again. And you put your money where your mouth is, says the Rambam, you skirt that area, you never go close to it, you make strategies not to do it, right? The real misuse of free will, again, it's, it requires a separate discussion, the ultimate misuse of free will is not to fail in an Nisoyim, it's to put yourself into the Nisoyim. Because either you'll fail, into what, you'll fall into what they call Taiva, into that side, or you'll fall into Gaiva. Either you'll succumb, 
and you'll fall into that, or you'll overcome it and express ego. I managed. So choosing the Avera is always a failure. The Gemara says clearly, a person comes to a fork in a road, where women, one fork takes him past a river, where women are doing some washing, perhaps, and they're immodestly exposed. The other road takes him home. So the man says to himself, well, look, which road shall I take? Am I not in the world to conquer ordeals? The Sili Sishorim says, you've created for three things. La avoid, la says mitzvahs, vela amod ben isayon. La avoid, to serve, to perform mitzvahs, vela amod ben isayon. Let me take the road where the women are, not look. Says the Gemara, if he takes the road where the women are and does not look, he's called a Russian evil man. Because he failed the test. The test is not whether you look at the women. The test is, which road will you take? And this individual not only failed, failed even to identify the test. Huh? That is a loss. So a young man said to me some time ago, I've just, back on, back on cocaine. Back on cocaine. What happened? I knew this, I knew this young man. He's a very talented young man. Very talented. He was achieving great things. And he eventually got into a habit. And, he, and eventually, as they put it, as they call it in the drug in the drug jargon, he bottomed out. He got to a point where he lost his wife and his family and he was almost died. And at that point, close to death, he managed to get into a rehabilitation program. And three and a half months later, he was, again in the technical jargon, dry. Came out of the rehabilitation program, got a job, and he rebuilt. He rebuilt everything. It was a remarkable rise and he was flying. What happened? So three weeks ago, I was driving home from work and I said to myself, I'm just going to go and visit my old dealer just to sit and face her and prove to myself that I've conquered it. So he went back to see her, and he's back on the drug. The problem is not what happened in front of that dealer. The problem is going back in the first place. It's unforgivable. That's against... Yeah. That's the misuse of free will. It's not mis- choosing wrongly. It's putting yourself into the situation. You note that Adam was not asked to do something. He was asked to not do something. Hashem didn't say, do. Hashem said, acknowledge that I am the misuse. And, and Adam or Rishon said to Hashem, you mean you want me just to be a passenger? Just to sit here and do nothing? Hashem said... It's exactly what I want. Give yourself to me. Admit that you are nothing and I'm everything. Then you become part of me. And he said, but, 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 but. You gave me this cosmic power. You want me not? And Hashem said, that's what I want. The ultimate Akeda. You know what the Akeda is? Isn't that a peculiar word? What would you have named that incident? Shechting. Ha'aloha. Raising him. Ha'krova. Korban. Akeda? To time? We always name things for the essence in Torah. Always. Nothing peripheral ever. The time? The essence is the sh- taking of the life, the spilling of the blood, one of the avoiders, something. Binding? That's the ultimate. Ultimate is the, is the withholding of power of self. It's the locking in and not expressing. That's the ultimate expression of the Anyway, that is what's meant by the three stages of not of vidu, of speaking it out, regret and remorse for the past, and not doing it again in the future. Let me just point out that when the Rambam says the more you speak, the better, yeah, the more you speak out, the better, there's one exception, and that is a kind of person who on Yom Kippur sits there and begins to recount the detail of the Avera, and before they know it, they're back in a reverie, you know, uh, back in a, 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 a delicious and very uh, technicolored, uh, you know, three-dimensional reenactment at the scene of the crime, there's very likely to be very little remorse in that type of uh, reconstruction. And in those circumstances, one should mention very generally the area and leave it up to, you know, the details to be filled in and move rapidly on while there's still a modicum of remorse. That is an exception to speaking out the details. But to the extent that one can speak out remorse, that is how it should be done. That summarizes the halachas of the, of the three basic elements. Do we, can we spend a few more moments? Yes? Is it, can we spend a few more minutes? Let's just spend a few minutes dealing with halachas very briefly of what happens when you've offended someone else. Incidentally, one important point, it's a critically important point, must not be omitted. Do you know that on Yom Kippur, in the Maksa, we never fulfill the third component? Okay, this is absolutely critical. The requirements of Chuba are vidui, Regret and saying you won't do it again. In the whole Maxo, there is plenty of vidui. There's plenty of remorse and regret. But there's no statement, I will not do this again. And if you do not say that, you've not fulfilled the mitzvah. Why was it not put into the liturgy? The reason is obvious. The reason is because we always speak in the plural. 
We're not going to go now into why that is. We always speak for all of us. So we can all say collectively we have done all these things. On the contrary, even if I haven't done it, I can say we have. I may not have done this detail or that, but I can say we have. And we can all say sincerely we all regret it, but I can't say you won't do it again. Well, you can't do that in the plural. And you have to know that. And therefore we confess in the plural, and you should do it in the singular as well. And we express remorse in the plural, you should do that in the singular. But if you don't say, I'll not do it again, you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah. There's an allusion to it in the Yilorotan at the end. Yilorotan nufanechva, shaloi echet ta'oid. Yilorotan, help me not to. Some say that is the beginning at least of this. But you need to say, I'll move away from this. I won't do it again. I'm, I'm. Okay, does this feel? Very briefly, this requires much more detailed discussion, but very briefly, the other two components are as follows. When the victim of the Avera is someone else, you have two very potentially thorny and messy, very demanding steps that have to be done. The Ramam says there's no hope, Chiva, if you haven't fixed up the problem. If you don't appease the person and make up the damage and you do Chiva, he says it's like going to a mikveh holding the source of contamination in your hand. That's ridiculous. It's not going to be purified that way. You first have to relinquish the problem and then do Chiva. Even after appeasing the person, you still have to do Chiva. You still have to speak to Hashem. But before you speak to him, you have to speak to the person. And it goes like this. First of all, you have to redress the wrong. You have to pay back what you took. Right? And if it wasn't financial, you can pay financially very often. On the contrary, we have five heads of damage in, in, in halacha, where you pay financially, even for injuring a person physically, even for causing them shame, even for pain. But the wrong has to be redressed and if necessary in financial terms. It does not say anywhere that the person has to know. It doesn't have to know. If you work for someone and certain funds have been misappropriated, you don't have to tell them. Not to fulfill this component. If the money is put back, so that wrong has been redressed. There's no requirement here that the person is told under this heading. I personally have dealt with cases, remarkable cases, where money had to be given back. Large sums of money. And in case you think it's difficult getting a large sum of money out of somebody, (laughs) try giving a large sum of money to somebody without telling him why. (laughs) There's a very suspicious... (coughs) circumstance, and uh, that has to be done, and ways and means can be developed, and if necessary, it has to be done. So, the damage has to be redressed. The problems here are when you can't find the person, when they're not alive anymore, when you dealt with many people. One gentleman came and he said to me, for the last 25 years, I've been running a business. Well, wealthy individual, I know the man personally, he's now become very much more motivated, Jewishly knowledgeable. For 25 years, I've been running a big business, and for 25 years, I've been overcharging and undersupplying. I want to pay it back. First of all, the man's not worth what it would cost to pay back 25 years of big business. And secondly, how does he find the people? Jews, non-Jews, alive, not alive. How does he begin to do that? So the voice can bring down, the Rambam starts the section by saying that all things can be corrected. That's the good news. Some are more difficult, but all things can be. And the, the sources bring down specifics. For example, if a person is no longer alive, one can give to the estate or the children where the benefit would have accrued. If that can't be done, then one should divest oneself of the money make an assessment, even if it's over a period of time, give it to Bastin, and preferably can be given to a community cause. Because by giving it out to the community, one has divested oneself of the, of the wrong, the problem, and will ripple out back to an effect where it should have been. It's not direct, and it's not perfect, but, but that is, that is the, the way. And there are many, many other details brought. So that is with regard to making of the damage. Finally, asking for forgiveness can be an extremely challenging so I'll mention this briefly and we'll close with that. Asking the person, being the fayes, as the Rambam says, to appease them can be extremely difficult. The reason is, first of all, most of us find great difficulty facing someone and saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong, and I, 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 it's just very hard to do. Secondly, sometimes you can't do it because they don't know it happened. Or they don't know it was you. And most of us can't face saying sorry, but when you have to go to a person and say, look, you don't know, but I'm the one who's been sticking this knife in your back for the last who knows how long, when they didn't know, most of us just much too squeamish to do that. And finally, what happens when you know they won't forgive you anyway? What happens in your better judgment? You go, they won't forgive you. They, they will bear a grudge against you, which is a Torah prohibition. They'll take revenge against you, which is another Torah prohibition. They won't forgive you anyway. What do you do there? You know the halakhic difference between taking revenge and bearing a grudge? You have to know the halakhic definition of Taking revenge is when you go to your neighbor and say, can I please borrow your lawnmower? And he says, no. And he comes up the next week and says, can I please borrow yours? If you say, no, that's called revenge. 
If you go to your neighbor and say, can I please borrow your lawnmower? And he says, no. And he comes over the next week and says, can I please borrow yours? And you say, sure, I'm not like you. <laughs> <laughs> that is, uh, it's a derisive, a Torah prohibition of bearing a grudge. You have to keep your mouth shut and give him the... They tell a story about a man who was crawling through the desert, a apocryphal story, crawling through the desert, dying of thirst, when another man rode past on the horse, looked down at him, and left him to die. Miraculously, he survived, and some years later, he ended up being the president of a big business corporation. And one day, his office door opened, and a man came in asking for a job. And he recognized the face as the face of the man who left him to die in the desert. Had he refused him the job, it would have been taking revenge, and had he reminded him and given him the job, it would be bearing a grudge, he said nothing and gave the man the job. That's what a Jew is required to do. Of course, if you didn't give him the job for a valid reason, for example, let's say that individual was applying to be a gentle, tender caregiver for frail, elderly, <laughs> you know, then you might judge the man as not suited to the occupation. If you did, that would be justified, right? You're not, that's not revenge, is it? So, that is, what do you do in such a situation? And we'll finish with this. There are halakhic opinions. Some say this was a famous argument between Rishol Salant and the Chavetz Chaim. Two different opinions on this matter. But I'll mention it, there is an opinion that you can ask a person forgiveness without telling them what you did. Some boys can don't like it, because how can they genuinely, sincerely forgive you if they don't know what you're talking about? Others say that as long as they mean genuine blanket forgiveness, then it's valid. If you sign a check without filling an amount in, and I fill the amount in, provided your account has the cover, then the check's valid. So someone says, I forgive you whatever you've done. If they mean it, and that's the problem. Does a person mean that? Or are they mouthing words? But if they mean whatever you've done, as often is a genuine meaning, for example, parents saying to children. Parents says to a child, it's a genuine forgiveness. Sometimes in difficult ex-marital situations, it's very difficult. The pain is often great and it's hard to do. These are problems. But, but, if a blanket forgiveness is given, it is, if it's meant, it's valid. The Ramam says, incidentally, that when one's asked for forgiveness, it's a specific cruelty to refuse. Right? And on the contrary, if you need forgiveness from someone, says the Ramam, ask them again and again. If they refuse, send a delegation of friends. If that fails, do it again. Fax them, email, whatever it takes. It doesn't say exactly, but <laughs> you do whatever it takes to importune them to gain their forgiveness. If you do that a required number of times and they still refuse, it's an unusual cruelty on their behalf, becomes their vera, and you're not required to ask anymore. Except if it's your Torah teacher, your Rebbe, then you're required to go back a thousand times. That's a unique exception, fascinating incident the Gemara that illustrates it. It's a bit late now to go into detail, but that is a unique exception. Otherwise, there's a certain number of times, then you leave it closed, the person. What happens to an individual who asks for forgiveness and cannot bring themselves to forgive? Here, one needs a little vested interest. Right? Let's say you've been very deeply hurt. Incidentally, you should forgive even if you're not asked. You know, being asked is not relevant. You know that in Tfilah Zaka, which we say before Yom Kippur, the Chavetz Chaim says to bring ahead. You know, there's, there's a beautiful part where you voluntarily forgive anyone who has anything on you. The Chavetz Chaim says not to leave it to where it's placed in the Tfilah. You may not get there. Say it right at the beginning. Right? You say, Hi Hashem, on this Erev Yom Kippur before Kol Nidre, I hereby forgive anyone who has anything on me. I want no one's accounting on my head this Yom Kippur. Right? And whether they deserve it or not, I let it go. And then you say, and in the merit of this effort, put into the hearts of anyone out there who has anything that I am, put into their hearts to forgive me at this point. And therefore, there is a vested interest. When you can't bring yourself to forgive someone, remember one detail of spiritual accounting. The whole din is midah connected midah. The whole judgment in Shemaim is only measure for measure. That's what it means, your hand writes. That's what it means. The only thing that happens is you are exposed to yourself. There's no courtroom in which people speak. and It's you being exposed to yourself. And all that happens to you is what you have done. And therefore, if you stand in the dock, that's Yom Kippur, or whenever it is, and you say, Hashem, forgive me, and you don't deserve to be forgiven, you won't be. You won't be forgiven. How can if you ask to be Rosh Hashanah, you're standing there asking to be forgiven, when you don't deserve it? You're my din. Din means you get what's coming to you. How can you ask for forgiveness when you don't deserve it? What sense does that make? There's one very good sense it makes. If you ask Hashem to forgive you for something that you genuinely do not deserve to be forgiven for, that you once forgave someone for something they did not deserve to be forgiven for, you'll be forgiven. Why? Because you did deserve it. You once did that. It's all medical and admitted. If you once for yeah, you better forgo something that wasn't deserved, so you have on your credit that particular energy. 
and therefore you deserve that because that's who you are. So it'll be done for you. It's not the first rate, full hearted beginning of the mitzvah, but it's good enough to get one motivated, start with the inner vested interest and use that thing. What do you do to somebody who is not willing to forgive or you predict that they will not forgive you? Ask them without telling them what you did. There are weighty, broad halachic shoulders that, that sanction this, and you can do it. How do you do it? And I'll finish with this. There's a wrong way and a right way. The wrong way is to walk up to the individual and say, you don't know what I did to you, but would you forgive me? That is not the way to go about it. One's imagination then tends to run wild, and you definitely won't be forgiven. What you do is you walk up to the person and you say, how are you doing? And then you say, you know, some Kippur coming up soon. And then you say to them, you know, I heard this very interesting talk the other night, <laughs> where I learned that there are a very interesting Jewish custom. Did you know that before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we all, in families and friends, we all forgive each other for anything that may have happened in our relationship. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and then, if, you know, uh, there's a resounding silence, you say, so I just came to tell you that I forgive you for anything that you ever may have done. Don't worry about it, and forget about it. And then you say, and by the way, in case there's any, you know, in our relationship, right, relationships like ours, who knows, maybe something happened somewhere where I behaved in a way that was not quite perfect, and therefore, if that possibly did happen somewhere in the past, would you mind just saying that you forgive me for anything that ever happened? And if they say, sure, it's over and forgiven, if they mean it, then you have achieved it. If they're mumbling some ancient formula that has no inner meaning, that does not achieve it. But if it is a man thing, even a person so petty that they wouldn't forgive you if they knew what it was, because of their small-minded pettiness when, when offended by the issue, can be large enough to forgive when not faced by their own pettiness, that could be done. And therefore, and therefore, that is the that is it. Let me finish, if there's any question on specifics that we dealt with that I've omitted to explain clearly. If not, I'll be very happy to remain for those who need to. Uh,